If you're a software developer, you might be being targeted by North Korean spies, which sounds crazy to think about, but it's actually true. And I'm gonna explain exactly how they're doing this and why. North Korea is so heavily sanctioned as a result of their nuclear weapons program that they've actually found out that they can gain more from cybercrime than they lose to sanctions. They've basically just decided we're just going to do state-sponsored cybercrime now. So there are actually units within North Korea's intelligence agencies who specialize in things like stealing Bitcoin and hacking companies, but not for espionage purposes. Now that really changes the dynamic. I've spent my entire career telling people, you're probably not interested enough to be targeted by state-sponsored hackers. But in the case of North Korea, if you're valuable enough to be targeted by cyber criminals, you're probably valuable enough to be targeted by them. Specifically, they really like to steal cryptocurrency, and that started off with them targeting crypto exchanges, but they also target individual users, and they do that through the targeting of software developers as well. Now, ironically, one of the first major cyber attacks I ever stopped in my cybersecurity career was WannaCry, which was a ransomware attack made by North Korea but they've evolved a lot since then. WannaCry was very rudimentary, but they've gone on to hack massive crypto exchanges, steal billions of dollars. And the last estimate that I saw for 2025 is that between 10 and 20% of their GDP now comes from stealing cryptocurrency. So how does this affect developers? Well, it's not just about stealing cryptocurrency. It's embedding themselves in any company, any network, any system that might have a return on investment. And one of their newest campaigns is something known as Contagious Interview. So what is Contagious Interview? Well, it works on the principle that in most software engineering roles, you will have to do some kind of practical skills challenge. Now, even if you've never worked as a software engineer or applied for a software development job, you've probably heard of leak code. Leak code challenges are one of the ways in which tech companies evaluate programming skills. They might give you a certain task and then you have to write code for that task. They're going to evaluate you on your ability to complete the task, potentially how quickly you complete it and the quality of the code that you wrote. Although with the remote jobs, it's quite common to just send you some kind of skills assessment. It might be source code for a software project that you're asked to test, edit, review, add features to, or any mix of the above. So software developers are really used to having to do coding challenges. Challenges. And that's where North Korea comes in. They've basically figured that they can reach out to developers, offer them high paying jobs, have them do an interview, and then send them a coding challenge to complete at home. And in some other cases, they've actually set up front companies, published job postings, which developers then go and apply for. But the end game is always the same. They get you to interview for a job that doesn't actually exist. You pass through to the next round of the interview, and then you come to the coding portion of the test. But what sort of challenges do they give you? Well, you probably guess by now it's infected with malware. And I get what you're thinking. Only an idiot would run malware on their work laptop, but you'd be completely wrong. These coding challenges take inspiration from very real ones which you would do for a real job. The only difference is the source code has a backdoor hidden deep within the code. And because it's a source code, most people just don't instinctively think this is malware because malware is usually executables or PowerShell scripts, and it just has a very malware feel to it. Whereas when someone sends you a source code, you're not intuitively gonna be like, well, this is malware because you can see the code, you can audit the code and see what it does and that is what they're betting on. So I've spent the last couple of weeks of my time not reverse engineering the malware because it's source code and I can simply just read it. And in doing so, I've actually discovered a lot of really clever ways in which they're backdooring the code. In one case, they'd actually typo squatted a very common Node.js package name. Essentially, Node.js has all these dependencies which implement certain features. And what they'd done is they'd just changed a single character in the package name and then they'd gone and uploaded a package under that name. So when you go and install the dependencies rather than the real package, it installs their malicious one. I've also seen malicious build tools which run malicious shell scripts. I've seen backdoored VS code extensions, but some of the most clever ones are actually some of the simplest. I'm gonna explain, but first a quick message from our sponsor. 
Today's video is sponsored by ThreatLocker. You can think of ThreatLocker as like the reverse of an antivirus. Rather than blocking known bad threats and then just allowing everything else, ThreatLocker allows known good software and blocks everything else, which stops you playing this cat and mouse game where threat actors come out with new malware and exploits, or they update their existing toolkits to bypass antivirus signatures. Because ThreatLocker is blocking everything that isn't already approved, it doesn't matter how good or how evasive the threat actor's malware or exploits are, it's simply just going to be blocked. But ThreatLocker goes far beyond just basic application allow listing. It has some really cool features like ring fencing, which allows you to lock down applications, which is an important protection against techniques known as living off the land, where threat actors will actually abuse legitimate software. One example of this is Microsoft Office macros, and another is PowerShell. Now, these are things that you might want enabled in your enterprise environment, but you certainly don't want threat actors abusing them. Now, in this example, I wrote a custom custom PowerShell downloader, which you can see is not being detected by my system's antivirus. However, when I run it, it doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because I've had ThreatLocker block PowerShell's ability to access the internet, except for websites that I've explicitly approved. So the malware is attempting to download more malware from a URL, but it can't access that URL and the script just fails. Another feature that I really like is ThreatLocker's user account control integration. One of the most common reasons that networks get compromised by ransomware is that the attackers will simply sit on an endpoint and wait for someone to come and type in administrator credentials. So if your IT administrator uses credentials to interact with the system in any way to elevate the process, the threat actor can then dump those and then use them to log into other systems on your network. And that is typically how they go from a foothold on an individual endpoint to a full network wide ransomware attack. In this one, they've simply just put some malicious code in one of the files, but they've padded it with so many spaces that it doesn't show up on the screen. So you can scroll up and down this file as much as you like, because the actual malicious code is off the side of the screen. And because most software developers don't enable word wrapping, because it essentially just makes your code look like spaghetti, they're not really going to notice something like this because no one is just scrolling a thousand characters to the right for no reason. Another one I found looks like it's handling an API token. And this does look like an API token because API tokens are often base64 encoded, and so is this text. Except when we decode it, it's actually a URL. What this code is doing is base64 decoding what is supposed to be an API token, but is actually a URL, connecting to the URL, and then running whatever code comes back. This is actually a very common technique I've seen across many different versions of this campaign. Uh, functions like exe or eval take in strings, convert the strings into code, and then run it. But it's so subtle because it's only a single line that most people will just skip over it. And on top of that, the coding tests are usually timed. They give you a very short window of time to complete the challenge, which is designed to discourage you from digging too deeply into the code. Usually they'll tell developers that they have 12, 24, 48 hours to implement a new feature and prove that it works. And this often causes causes the developers to start the work on their work laptop. Because if it's during the day and they're using their work computer and they suddenly have to do this coding challenge really quickly, they're just gonna download it and run it on their work machine, which is what the attackers are of course betting on. I actually saw several cases where the developers ran this on their corporate issued laptop giving the threat actors access to the corporate network. But what's crazy is this single campaign serves so many different purposes. They have info stealers, they have cryptocurrency stealers, miners, code for pivoting on the network. They can get a lot of value out of this one infection. If you have any cryptocurrency, they're of course going to steal it, but they also try to break into companies. Now they do have preferred types of companies. They like to go after developers in FinTech, especially the those who work for crypto exchanges, because the biggest win is gonna be if they can actually break into a crypto exchange and steal their crypto rather than an individual investor who might have anywhere from like a couple of hundred to a couple of million dollars. And I think in one case, they actually made off with a quarter of a billion dollars in cryptocurrency by getting into a crypto exchanges network. So if you're a software developer, you really need to be paying attention to these kind of interviews. You need to be looking for red flags such as does this recruiter actually work for the company they claim and are they an authorized representative? Does the company that I'm applying for being recruited for even exist or was it just formed this year? Is it even
even a registered LLC or do they only have a website? And there's also other tells like, is this a fair amount of time to complete this task? Because if a real company was asking me to simply just drop everything and complete their coding challenge in the next 12, 24, 48 hours, even if that was a legitimate company, I would not want to work there because they obviously don't value work-life balance. But the easiest way to protect yourself is to simply use a virtual machine because most virtual machine software allows you to create snapshots. And snapshots basically just create images of your VM at that state in time, which allows you to then roll it back to that previous state. So if it becomes infected with malware, you can simply just roll it back to an earlier state. Now you don't wanna be putting actual sensitive information into this VM, don't log into any accounts, don't put your real GitHub tokens in there, don't put your AWS API keys in there, just keep it devoid of any sensitive information. Now, if you do need access to any platform, just create a throwaway account, and then you can use that environment to do any and all coding challenges. It doesn't matter if it's North Korean malware or a real challenge for a real company, you can just set up your development environment in a virtual machine and then roll it back after you're done. But one thing I will caution about virtual machines is if you give it the ability to access the internet and you're connected to say a corporate network, it can potentially scan that network, which you have to be really, really careful with. One way you can protect against this is configuring custom firewall rules to prevent your VM from accessing certain network resources or just running a VPN on your host machine while you're using the VM. But you have to make sure that the VPN you're running actually does block all local network access because some don't. Or you can create a second VM which acts as a router and then you can route one VM through the next and have the next just have a drop everything firewall rule that only allows connections to go out to the internet and not to your local network. But that's a little bit more complicated and very hard to set up. So I would recommend going with one of the first two options or simply just using a public Wi-Fi or creating a network segment which is isolated from the rest of your network. But anyway, I hope this video was helpful. And as always, if it was, please like and subscribe. It helps out my channel and I will be back with more videos shortly.